Hello and welcome to today's lesson looking at more examination questions for the periodic motion topic in AQA A-level physics. So in today's lesson we're going to look at more extended questions now of periodic motion. So we're going to look see how we can answer these extended style questions on periodic motion. So if we're successful and we learn in today's lesson we understand the different topics and the concepts of the periodic motion topic. We can answer questions on periodic motion and ultimately we can review our understanding on periodic motion and look to how to improve further. So let's have a look at some questions now regarding periodic motion. So in this question there's a lot of information to decode before we start answering the question. So figure 1 shows a seismometer usually detects the horizontal movement of the ground caused by an earthquake. The rigid case is fixed to the ground. When an earthquake occurs, the ground moves horizontally, so the rigid case also moves horizontally. Initially, the heavy pendulum bob remains in its original position due to its high inertia. Now, figure 1 shows the pendulum immediately after the earthquake is detected. The rotating drum moves at a steady speed. Figure 2 shows the trace produced on the graph that's attached to the rotating drum following the earthquake. Now, let's have a look at what the first question is. State whether the ground was moved towards A or B to produce the situation shown in figure 1. Well, again, the trick you've got to do with these types of questions is read the information. It says, initially, the heavy bob remains in its original position due to its high inertia. So if we look at this diagram and it's displaced in a particular direction, then therefore we can see why that's the case, because the object hasn't moved, rather the ground has moved underneath it. And if we look at the particular situation, it indicates to us that the ground has moved towards B, so it has moved like that accordingly, because that allows it to move, look like it's further towards A, because it's all shifted across towards B. Now the next question is determine the magnitude of the initial displacement of the ground that caused the trace in figure 2. Now if we look at what the initial displacement is going to be, it's going to be the amplitude of the wave. So it's a case of looking at how many divisions is your amplitude and multiply it by the unit of that division. We look at the information and one division is 0 0.20 millimetres and there are 15 squares or divisions from equilibrium, so it's going to be 15 times by 0.20, it is 3 millimetres. Now again, look at use the data from figure 2 to calculate the distance between the point of suspension of the pendulum and the centre of mass of the bob. Assume the arrangement is a simple pendulum. Now a few things here. We're trying to find the length of the pendulum and we're told it's a simple pendulum. So this should set up some alarm bells in your head and realise we should be using the simple pendulum equation. T equals 2 pi times by the square root of L over G. We're going to have to rearrange that and make L the subject. The next thing is what value do we use for time? Well, if we look at our previous figure 2, we know that the time period is the time taken for one complete oscillation. So we look across this particular graph and we see how many squares are needed horizontally to produce one whole oscillation. The answer is 0 0.80 seconds when we we'll consider one division represents 0.2 seconds. So we pop that into the equation and we get an answer out of 0.16 meters. Now, state and explain the, the effect of using a bob of the same radius with smaller mass on the initial displacement. Now, again, the first hint you've got to think about is there are two factors that affect any simple harmonic motion. You've got your restoring force, but you've also got your inertia. Now, what does inertia depend upon? Well, inertia depends upon mass. So the idea is you've got a lower displacement and you've got a lower inertia, so therefore it begins to move as it's more likely to begin to move as the Earth moves. But in the second idea, how would the effect of using a smaller mass on the time period of the oscillation of the bob be? Well, we know T equals 2 pi times by the square root of L over G. We know that M is not in that equation, so it has no effect. The next question, it says, determine whether the amplitude of oscillation shown in figure 2 decreases exponentially. Well, again, we look back at figure 2 here, and we can see our peaks, or our maximum amplitude at that particular point. So what you've got to do, is you've got to work out the consistency of the ratios. You've got to take 
the different values and ratio them and see how much it's altering between each step. Now, what you should always do is at least do two ratios and then determine whether it's a similar rate ratio or it's a different ratio and then make a conclusion based on that. Now, explain why the amplitudes of oscillation decrease following the initial displacement. Well, again, hopefully you should remember that all oscillations are damped, or there is air resistance, or there's friction acting on the object. So energy is lost because of this air resistance, and therefore it's dissipated out of the oscillating system, so the amplitude is not as high. State and, effect, state and explain the effect of using a bob with the same radius but a smaller mass on the time taken for the bob to come to rest following the initial displacement. Now, once again... We've got mass here. And what does mass affect? Well, mass doesn't affect the time period equation, but it does affect the inertia of the object because inertial, inertial mass is the main determinant of inertia. So therefore, it'll come to rest quicker because it's got a lower inertia, so damping force has a greater effect. Or you could say it'll have less energy stored in it because the mass is lower. Or you could say the bob loses a greater proportion of its energy during each oscillation because there is less mass and therefore energy in the system. Right, another question looks the following. A child is sitting on a swing. The swing is pulled back and released uh, from rest at a time of t equals zero. The child and swing oscillate with simple harmonic motion. Outline what is meant by simple harmonic motion. Well, this is a very common question in examinations. Two marks. Right. Simple harmonic motion is when the acceleration is directly proportional to displacement, but it's directed towards equilibrium or directed in the opposite direction to the displacement. Next question. The child and swing behave as a simple pendulum of length 2.25 metres. Show that the period of oscillation of the swing is approximately 3 seconds. Well, again, it tells us period of oscillation. So we've got to use the time period equation. T equals 2 pi times by the square root of L over G. We pop our values in. We must remember that G is 9.81 on Earth. Our answer is T equals 3.01 seconds. The next one, the amplitude of motion is 1.20 meters. The combined mass of the child of the swing is 18 kilograms. Calculate the change of kinetic energy of the child in swing as the system moves from a point of maximum displacement to the equilibrium position. So we've got to remember that the swing is still acting like a simple harmonic oscillator, so we've got to use the simple harmonic oscillator questions. So we work out what the velocity is going to be at the um, at the particular point, so what can we use? We can use V equals A omega, and that, that's for V max, so that is going to be the velocity at the equilibrium position, so we work it out with that methodology. We then use kinetic energy is equal to a half mv squared and work out our value. We can then do the same for the point of maximum displacement. We work out the difference between the two, and then we can work out our answer like that. Now you've also just got to be aware that at the maximum, uh, sorry, at the maximum displacement, the velocity is going to be zero. So you're going to have to use the angular velocity at that particular point and work it through like that. Now the next one, sketch on figure one the graphs show the variation of displacement with time and variation of velocity with time for two complete oscillations. So the first thing we've realised from the previous question is we've worked out the time period is approximately three seconds. So what we've got to do is for displacement time graph, well we're going to have a cosine graph which will work through with the maximum amplitude of 1.2 metres as was stated in the question previously and a time period of three seconds. Whilst the velocity time graph is going to be a sine curve which starts at zero but also has the same time period which works through like that. Right, next question. Figure, th figure 7 shows three simple pendulums suspended from a ceiling. Table 1 shows the properties of each pendulum. The three pendulum rods are pulled forward by the same small horizontal distance, and then released from rest at the same time. Ignore air resistance and compare the oscillations of the three pendulums. Now, the first thing you've got to think about is as follows. Right, they, X and Y have the same length. Now, if you remember, there are only two factors that affect the time period of an oscillation for a pendulum, and that is length and the strength of gravity. They're all in the same roots, the same strength of gravity. So, therefore, X and Y will have the same time period, whilst we know that Z, because it's going to have a longer um, length, it will have a longer time period. But the other thing we've got to note is the idea that they're all oscillating with the same amplitude because there's no effect of air resistance, 
and the fact is that they're all pulled back by the same amount so they'll all have the same amplitude is such like that right the next question a piece of stiff card of negligible mass is attached to pendulum z is shown the card damps the motion of the pendulum the pendulum bob is pulled forward by the small the same small horizontal distance is in 3.1 and released from rest explain the effect of dampening on the oscillations well there's always going to be fewer oscillations because dampening is going to dissipate energy to the surroundings but because it's going to be light dampening in this case the oscillations are the same frequency and time period but the amplitude will reduce quite rapidly right the next question a simple pendulum of length 0.40 so 450 meters is set in oscillation Iceland, calculate the frequency of the pendulum. Well, we know that T equals 2 pi times by the square root of L over G. And we've got a value for G in table 2 for Iceland. We can work out the time period, and then we say time period is 1 over frequency. So frequency is 1 over time period, and then work out our answer to be 0.745 hertz. Now explain how a simple pendulum in Kenya could be made to oscillate at the same frequency as the simple pendulum in Iceland. Now you may wish to support your answer with a calculation, which is code for support your answer with the calculation. So what you've got to do is you've got to realise you've got to decrease the length of the pendulum. You do this because if you look at the equation t equals 2 pi times by the square root of L over G, and you look in Kenya, you look for the value of Kenya that G is smaller. So therefore, to get the same value, you're going to have to decrease the length of the pendulum. So when G gets smaller, L gets smaller by the, by the same token to get that same value for T. Now, if you work it through, you can work through what when you put the values for t in let's say it's the same so let's just say the time period is one second okay for each one you can then rearrange that make l the subject work out the l for kenya work out the l for iceland and therefore you can work it out to be a decrease of 0.004 meters Right, the next question. A student is investigating the forced air vertical oscillations in the spring. Two springs, A and B, are suspended from a horizontal metal rod that is attached to a vibration generator. The stiffness of A is K and the stiffness of B is 3K. Two equal masses are suspended from the springs as shown. The vibration generator is connected to a signal generator. The signal generator is used to vary the frequency of oscillations of the metal rod. The signal generator is set to 2 Hz. The mass attached to the spring oscillates with a maximum amplitude of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. That has a maximum kinetic energy of 54 millijoules. So deduce the spring constant for A and the mass suspended from it. Right, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to realize it's still a simple harmonic oscillator. So what can we work out? Well, we can work out what the maximum velocity is going to be by doing 2 pi times by frequency to get omega and then we multiply it by the amplitude which is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 2 so we get our maximum velocity to be 0.314 meters then we use the fact that the kinetic energy equation is equal to a half mv squared and we've got v and we've got kinetic energy in the equation we can work out what the mass is going to be so we rearrange it and we say that 2 ek over v squared is going to equal mass we pop our numbers through and we get an answer of 1.1 kilograms we can then pop this into the equation that frequency is equal to 1 over 2 pi times by the square root of k over m rearrange that make k the subject work it through and we get 173 newtons per meter now can i just clarify where do we get that idea from well we get this idea from looking in the question and seeing what information is being given to us now if you look in the question it gives us amplitude and it gives that indicates and it gives us frequency so that indicates we can work out the velocity because we know the velocity of a simple harmonic generator or oscillator is going to be v max is equal to omega a where omega is 2 pi f we then know we can work out mass because we've got the kinetic energy and we know kinetic energy is a half mv squared and then once we've got k we know 2 pi we can then work out what the m is going to be so the k yeah the m is going to be because we can the k is sorry because we can then use that previous frequency equation now the next question is calculate the frequency in which the mass attached to spring b oscillates with the maximum amplitude well again we've got to use the equation frequency equals 
uh, 1 over 2 pi times by the square root of k over m, which is just the time period uh, equals 1 over f, and we worked it through like that. So this tells us for the same mass, which it tells us in the question I've got the same mass, frequency is directly proportional to the square root of k, so therefore if we're doubling this, if we double this idea, we go 2 times by the square root of 3, because it's 3 times as much as being constant, so therefore the frequency is going to be 2 times by the square root of 3, which is 3.5 hertz, because that's what our frequency was in the previous question too, so we're multiplying it by this factor of square root 3, because the spring constant is 3 times higher in B than it is A. Right, in this next question, figure 2 shows how the amplitude of oscillations of mass varies with frequency for spring A. The investigation is repeated with the mass attached to spring B immersed in a beaker of oil. A graph of the variation of the amplitude with frequency for spring B is different from the graph in figure 2. Explain two differences in the graph for spring B. Well, the information is we're immersed in the beaker of oil, so there's going to be a dampening effect. So the first idea is the idea that for spring B, okay, we're going to have a, a resonance peak at a higher amplitude or a higher frequency because there's a higher spring constant, so it's stiffer. So the idea is compared from A to B, you've got that example, but you've also got dampening going on, so therefore the peak will be broader due to dampening, and the amplitude will be lower at all frequencies due to the energy losses from the system, and you would also argue that the resonant frequency could also be shifted slightly to the left because you've got a greater effect of dampening. Now, the next question is a bit of a multiple choice one. The frequency of a body remain, uh, moving with simple harmonic motion is doubled. If the amplitude remains the same, which of the following is also doubled? Well, the answer is going to be C, because if the amplitude is the same, the distance covered by the body is the same, whilst the time period is doubled. This means the velocity of the body is doubled. So the answer would therefore be C. Question 2. A particle oscillates with undamped simple harmonic motion. The acceleration of the particle is always what? Well, it's always going to be it's going to be d because the acceleration will be zero whilst at top speed. So your acceleration is least when the speed is greatest. And whilst that is true for simple harmonic motion, it's true for any type of motion as well. Question three: A bob of mass 0 0.50 kilograms is suspended from the end of a piece of string. 0.45 meters long. The bob is rotated in a vertical circle at a constant rate of 120 revolutions per minute. What is the tension in the string when the bob is at the bottom of the circle? Well, firstly, we've got to look at the information given. We've been given the radius of the circle, we've been given the angular velocity. So that indicates to us straight away that we can work out the linear velocity, because linear velocity is V equals R. Uh, times by angular velocity. But we've got to convert angular velocity into radians. So we convert that into radians and we'll work out the linear velocity is 5.65 meters per second. We then look back at the diagram. Now at the bottom of the circle, the tension is acting towards the center of the circle, but the weight of the bob is acting away from the center of the circle, downwards. So therefore, the centripetal force is the resultant force towards the center of the circle. So the centripetal force is equal to tension minus weight, because weight's going away from the center, tension is going towards the center. We then pop our equations in of mv squared over r equals t minus mg. We know m, we know g, we've just worked out v, so we, can pop all, we know r, so we, we pop all these into the equation as shown, we then work it through, we take things around to make t the subject, and we get an answer of 40 newtons, which is d. Next question. A mechanical oscillator is set into motion by a periodic driving force whose frequency is steadily increased from a low value. What is correct for this particular system? Well, the answer is D, because force vibrations occur at all frequencies, not a particular ones. Dampening occurs at all frequencies as well. Resonance will occur regardless of dampening, so therefore it, it doesn't just occur when it's a minimum. And then finally, the oscillator will not continue to resonate when the periodic driving force is removed. That is correct, because resonance can only take place when the driving frequency is equal to the natural frequency. Remove the driving force, you remove the driving frequency. Question 5. A simple pendulum and a mass spring system perform simple harmonic motion on Earth with the same period t. Both systems are moved to a region where the gravitational field strength is four times the surface of the Earth. 
was the period of each system when oscillating in its new location. Well, firstly, for the mass spring system, it's irrelevant because the only two factors affecting the time period for the mass spring are m and k, so it's just going to be t. But then when we look at the, at the um, pendulum, gravitational field is related to the pendulum's time period by 1 over t squared. This means that when the gravitational field is quadrupled, the time period is going to half, so the answer is a. Right, the next one. The diagram shows the string x, y supporting heavy pendulum P and four pendulums A, B, C and D of smaller mass. Pendulum P is set into oscillation perpendicular to the plane of the diagram. Which of the pendulums A to D oscillates with the largest amplitude? Well, the answer is going to be B. Because the pendulum with the same length has the same natural frequency as the driving frequency, so therefore it will undergo resonance. Because remember, the only factors that affect the natural frequency are the same as the time period, the length and the gravitational field strength. So P and B will have the same length to so the same frequency, so the driving frequency of pendulum P equals the natural frequency of pendulum B. So pendulum B undergoes resonance, so oscillates with the largest amplitude. Next question. A thin aluminium sheet hangs from pivot P. The sheet has an arc radius of 17 centimetres and an arc length of 12 centimetres, as shown. The angle between the sides of the sheet is theta, so that theta is approximately 0.7 radians. We do a little bit of trigonometry here, because we know that the angle is going to be arc length over radius, 12 over 17, 0.71 radians. The next one. The sheet is pulled to the side and released to oscillate in the vertical plane. A light gate is placed directly below P. The, sh the sheet swings from side to side, interrupting the light beam. A data logger records the time T for which the sheet interrupts the light beam during the swing. Figure 3 shows the variation of T with the number of swings through the light gate. The average angular speed during one swing of the sheet is omega. So determine that using figure 3, the largest value of omega. Well, how can we work this through? Well, we're trying to work out the largest value, and we know that omega is equal to 2 pi over t. So, therefore, you need to use the smallest t to get the biggest value, because we're dividing by t. So, you look on your graph, and you find the smallest value for t. And the smallest value for t is at 0.12 seconds. So, that's at one swing. Now, we know at one swing, it's going to have an angular displacement of 2 pi. So we're going to do 2 pi over 0.12, so we get our largest value of 5.8 or 5.9 radians per second. Now the sheet completes more, more than 18 swings before coming to a stop, suggests why the result of the T cannot be recorded after 18 swings. Well, we're using a light beam to work out when a swing is taking place, and the idea is the sheet will not clear the light beam after 18 swings, due to the effect of dampening reducing the amplitude. Now this next question is a link between periodic motion and electromagnetic induction covered in magnetic fields. So the aluminium sheet is now made to swing through a uniform magnetic field between two magnets as shown in figure 9. Now the sheet is released in the same position as in question 1.2. Uh, the presence of the magnetic field increases the dampening of the oscillation of the sheet. So explain why. Well, let's just think about this not normally. Okay, It's not going to be just attracted to the magnet, because what's going to happen is there's going to be a change in flux, or there's going to be a flux linkage in the actual aluminium sheet as it passes through the magnetic field of the magnet. This will induce an EMF, which induces a current, this will, uh, this will oppose the motion due to Lenz's law, which will then indicate that energy will be lost out of the system because it's opposing the direction of motion, so it will slow down. Right, another question. When an object moves in a circular path at constant speed, a resultant force is required. State why a resultant force is required in the direction of this force. Well, if it's moving in a circle, even if the speed is constant, the direction is changing, so the velocity is changing. The only thing that can cause a acceleration or a change in velocity is a resultant force, which always acts towards the centre of the circle because it's in a circular path. Now, when an aeroplane is flying, there's an upwards force called lift, which acts at right angles to the, wheel, to the wings. When the aeroplane is flying in a straight line, the lift force is equal to the weight of the aeroplane. This diagram shows an aeroplane that's moving in a horizontal circle at a constant speed. Explain in terms of forces why the aeroplane is able to fly in a circular path. 
well. It's the idea that there's going to be a horizontal component to the lift. Now you can tell there's a horizontal and vertical component to the lift force because it's at an angle. So whilst the vertical force will oppose the weight, the horizontal force will act towards the centre of the circle, so acts as the centripetal force, which allows it to move in a circle. Now, the aeroplane has a mass of 2.4 times 10 to the 6 kilograms and is flying in a horizontal circle at a speed of 85 meters per second when the angle is 25 degrees. Consider both the horizontal and vertical motion, calculate the radius of the circular path. Now, when it says consider both horizontal and vertical, you've got to resolve it horizontally using L sine theta. You've got to resolve it vertically using L cos theta and work out these values. So you resolve vertically and you say L cos theta, the vertical component of the lift force, will equal the weight mg. You can resolve horizontally and say L sine theta, the horizontal uh, component of the lift force equals mb squared over r because acting as the centripetal force. We can then work out those values so we can have a, the, um, the L in terms of the vertical force to be 2.6 times 10 to the 7 and then it allows you to work that particular bit through. You can then pop L into the equation of L sine theta equals mv squared over r and therefore you can work out r because you know all of the terms. Alternatively, you can say L cos theta and L sine theta. Well, we can link that together. So we can say L sine theta over L cos theta is going to then equal mv squared over r divided by mg. Sine theta over cos theta equals tan theta, and the L's cancel through. So we have tan theta equals v squared over rg because those small m's cancel through, and you can then rearrange that make R the subject and work your answer out. The next one, the International Space Station is in orbit at a height of 400 kilometers above the Earth's surface. The ISS completes 15.5 orbits in 24 hours. Calculate the angular velocity of the ISS in radians per second. So we say that the angular velocity is 2 pi over t, so we do 2 pi over the time in seconds for a complete orbit, so we do 24 times by 60 times by 60, and we do well, one complete rotation is 2 pi, but we've got 15.5 in 24 hours, so 2 pi times by 15.5, so we get 1.13 times 10 to the minus 3 radians. Now, students suggest the ISS is traveling at a constant speed, so according to Newton's laws, there'll be no resulting force acting on it. Criticize this suggestion. Well, although the speed is constant, the velocity is changing since the tangential direction of motion is changing, so therefore it is accelerating. So by Newton's first law or Newton's second law, that must, re must result in a resultant or centripetal force acting towards the center of the circle. Now calculate the magnitude of the centripetal force acting the ISS. You've been given its mass and you've been given its radius. Now in the previous question, we have worked out the angular velocity. So that tells us we should really use F equals m r omega squared. Pop your values in, but the trick you're going to have to work out is r is not going to be the sur is not going to be the distance from the surface of the Earth to the ISS. Rather, it's the distance from the centre of the Earth to the ISS. So you take your radius of your Earth. You add it to the radius of the orbit to work out the total value of r, and you work it through to be 3.6 times 10 to the 6 newtons. A, some, some sensitive assigned of equipment is being transported by the road. To protect the equipment, it is placed in the box which is mounted on springs. There are four springs, one at each corner of the box. Each spring has a force constant of 450 newtons per meter. The total mass of the equipment and the box is 4.3 kilograms. And we know the time period for a mass attached to the spring of the spring constant k and the center oscillation is given by t equals 2 pi times by the square root of m over k. So calculate the natural frequency of the box. So what you do is you work out the time period by using the equation given. Then you can work it through like that. So you can work out what k is going to be. Now the trick is that we've got um, each spring is 450, but there are four springs. So the total spring constant is four times by 450. So we pop that in like that, and we get our time period to be 0.307 seconds. Then you say frequency is one over time period, so you get 3.26 hertz. Next one, state what is meant by simple harmonic motion and why the oscillation of the box is an example of this. So what's our definition? 
that the acceleration is directly proportional to the displacement equilibrium acting towards equilibrium or in the opposite direction to the displacement and therefore it works through because in this situation that's what's taking place and the box must be undergoing simple harmonic motion because the spring is obeying Hooke's law so therefore it follows those particular rules. Now a car suspension system can be thought of as a mass spring system. The natural frequency of the system is determined by the spring constant of suspension K and the total mass of system N. The car is set into vertical oscillation by applying a momentary downwards force. And we can work out the frequency of oscillation that's given by F equals 1 over 2 pi times square root of K over M. Because like we said before, the resulting force acting on the particular value is Kx. So therefore Ma is equal to minus Kx because it's in the opposite direction. Now we know that a equals minus, uh, minus omega squared x. So what we can then say is if we know that, we say A is equal to minus kx over m. So therefore omega squared is equal to k over m. And then we know omega is equal, also equal to 2 pi f. So we can say that 2 pi f squared is equal to k over m, which then works through to be f equals 1 over 2 pi times by the square root of k over m. When you're doing this, just always remember that anything undergoing simple harmonic motion must follow Newton's laws, so you can take what you've learned in the mechanics topic and you can apply it to this one. Now the next question, the car is displaced through a vertical distance of 27.5 millimetres when a man of mass 85 kilograms sits in the car, show K is about 30 ki uh, kilonewtons per metre, so again we know F equals Kx, then what do we do? We can say therefore K is equal to F over X or mg over x, so therefore 85 times by 9.81 over 27.5 times by 10 to the minus 3. Remember, we've got millimetres there, so you work it out to be 3.03 .03 times 10 to the 4 newtons newton per metre. Now calculate the natural frequency of the oscillation when the man is sitting in it, and the mass of the car is 1,130 kilograms. So we use our equation we had previously, F equals 1 over 2 pi times by the square root of k over m. Now the trick in this question is we use the k from the previous question and we've got to add the mass of the man and the car together to get our total mass of the system. So it's 1130 plus 85. We work it all through and we get 0 0.79 hertz. The car suspension systems are examples of damp systems. What do we mean by damp? And why is it desirable for a car suspension system? Well, dampening is a force which causes the transfer of energy from the oscillation system, so therefore it reduces the amplitude of vibration. That means the oscillations reduce in amplitude quickly, so it prevents the transfer of energy to the oscillation of the car body, so the car won't rock up and down as much. Now, the graph shows a way in which displacement varies with time for an undamped mass spring system. On the axis below, uh, draw a graph which shows the velocity varies with time for a damp system over the same interval. Well, firstly, what do we know? We know that velocity is going to be shifted by pi over 2 or 90 degrees. So it's not a sign variation like the displacement is. It's been shifted by pi over 2 or 90 degrees. So it becomes a cosine. And, and so therefore, we've got our cosine graph. But the second thing is it's a damp system. So if it's a damp system, there's less energy in the system. So therefore, we should have a smaller um, peak and trough than the, than the first one. And also it should be decreasing because energy is leaving the system. Right. Hopefully, you've been, if you've been successful and you've learned in this particular lesson, you understand the different concepts that are covered in the periodic motion topic. You can answer questions on periodic motion and you can review your understanding on periodic motion and how to improve this further. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson looking at different periodic motion questions found in examinations and you found it useful to see how you can answer these types of questions. Have a lovely day.